we all know how to think. And with our minds, we can rationalize anything. We can make anything happen. People work in their self-interest, but we all know that you don't work in your self-interest all the time. Because when emotion comes into it, the wiring changes in the way it functions. I look at life and say, there's two master lessons. One is, there's the science of achievement. That's how do you take the invisible and make it visible, right? How do you take what you dream about and make it happen? Whether it be your business, your contribution to society, money, whatever it is for you, your body, your family. But the other lesson of life that is rarely mastered is the art of fulfillment. When it comes to fulfillment, that's an art. And the reason is it's about appreciation and it's about contribution. You can only feel so much by yourself. What is it that's gonna truly fulfill you? What is it that's gonna give you that extraordinary life? What's gonna make things magnificent on your terms, not somebody else's terms, not your father, your mother, your background. What is that really? You can have a ton of money and still be miserable. Right. You know, so it's, it's really, it's, it's like mastering the science of achievement, but also the art of fulfillment. It's about, if you're totally successful, but you're not fulfilled, then what do you have? You have nothing. You know, you made everybody happy but yourself. Uh, you know, that's the worst thing you got. That, that's Robin Williams is a beautiful man. Such a beautiful man killed himself, right? And he achieved everything most people ever dream of. But a beautiful family, you've made the whole world laugh, hundreds of million people love him, but he didn't figure out how to end the suffering. Money won't do that. Things, getting things is not gonna make you happy. You know, it doesn't matter what you get, it doesn't matter whether it be money or opportunity, all those things might excite you for the moment. You know, even a relationship, as magnificent it may be, might be exciting for a while, but if you don't keep growing, that relationship isn't gonna stay exciting. So the secret to real happiness is progress. Progress equals happiness. And if we can make progress on a regular basis, we feel alive. Progress is an aliveness to it, doesn't it? You don't have to work at changing. Change is automatic. Your body's gonna change whether you want it or not as the years go by. And no matter how hard you work, there's gonna be some changes going on there. And the economy is gonna change no matter what you want it to do. The weather is gonna change. Relationships are gonna change. Everything in life is always changing. We don't have to work on change. Change is automatic, but progress is not. So if you wanna make real progress, then you really gotta look at your life in a different way. You gotta say, I gotta take control of this process and not just hope it's gonna work out like people do who make a resolution. I believe in energy, I believe in inspiration because inspired in spirit, the opposite of that is kind of dead. I believe in being inspired. But I'm a strategist. You know, you're, if you're inspired and you run east looking for a sunset, I don't give a damn how enthusiastic you are, how positive you are, it's not gonna happen. So I'm a strategist first, but I really do believe that people have gotta look at their life and say, as much as I want great strategy, I need a great philosophy of my life that's gonna make me fulfilled. Right. If you're fulfilled, like you said, you mentioned earlier, if you were with your friends and you guys weren't succeeding, but you're having a damn good time with this camaraderie, it's still worthwhile. And you can find a way to succeed eventually. But what the hell is success? It's hitting an expectation. And I always tell people, man, trade your expectations for appreciation and it's a whole new world instantly. Yeah. If you can appreciate this moment, if you can't find ecstasy in this moment, in a conversation with a friend and looking in your wife's eyes, being with your children, going on a run, a if you can't find ecstasy now, I'm here to tell you more money, more people, more love, more business, more anything is not going to give you more access. Right. You got, if you can't do it here now, you're not going to do it there when you got more. Right. So why not do it now and, and have a rich life right now? I tell people, money, that's one thing. Like having financial abundance, there's skills. That's a science. But wealth, it's a decision. It's like you can be wealthy right now. I, I live in Fiji a good portion of the time. There are these villagers there. They're the richest people I know. They're happy. They laugh. They love. They don't give a damn about the economics. Other people say they're poor. When I first went there, I was trying to do things for them. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm so happy. <laughs> Wealthy people come over from the United States and they go travel around and try to figure out what to do. And they're gonna spend nine you know, years to do this and this and this, so they can finally sit down and be happy. And the Fijian guy goes, why don't you sit on the beach right now, dude, and experience it? Why spend the nine years? Why not have it now? That's my invitation. In the end, what we get will never make us happy. I don't care how many stars on your chart, how many Academy Awards, how much money you make. What makes us happy is progress. Progress equals happiness. If you're not growing, you're dying inside. If you find your passion, you're gonna have this tremendous energy. It's sustainable energy. But momentum requires you always do the next thing to keep the momentum going. And the reason you get yourself in a passionate place is so that you change your life. And the only thing that changes your life is making a decision. So while you're in this passionate state, that's where you make decisions. When people talk about work-life work balance, I was talking to Mary Calhoun Erdos, who's 
um, you know, Morgan Stanley, she, man she manages $2.6 trillion, with a T, dollars. Probably the most influential woman in the financial world. Brilliant woman. And I asked her, because, you know, I was interviewing 50 of the smartest financial people on the face of the earth. I said, I know you're a very deeply caring mom and you know, wife, and how do you balance all that? And she said, Tony, she goes, I read this one of your books. She didn't quote it, but she goes, there is no such thing as work-life balance. There's only work-life integration. And I really believe that in my soul. So in my companies, uh, you know, my wife and I, we live our mission together. We're 24-7, 365 together, and we love it um, because we're driven by the same things. Um, one of my sons is a partner in several of my financial businesses. One of my other sons is in the coaching business. Um, you know, my daughter's an actress and, you know, totally different business, but she cares for people the same way. So there's a common denominator within our family. We're all so mission-driven that we don't have to separate the two. When your family is involved in your mission, you're not pulled apart. You're pulled together in the same direction. I think the hard part is so many families have totally different lives and they come together when they're exhausted and try to have a relationship together. And I think that's really hard for people today. I always encourage people to say, listen, in, in your partnership in life, you want to find somebody who's your best friend because intimacy and passion is easy to turn on, but friendship is not. And if you have a friend who shares your values and your mission, and then if you're privileged enough to do things together as a business owner, I find that to be uh, the greatest possibility of that work-life integration. When does a man or woman die? When their dreams die. When do we die? When we stop developing ourselves, expanding our minds, challenging ourselves, raising the bar on ourselves. The best thinking that, that I had at that point in my life had produced this life that I have. I need some help on where Einstein was. He said, the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. I applaud you for investing in yourself, for coming here, flying thousands of miles, investing money in yourself. I can tell you, based upon my own experience, you have something special. You have greatness within you. What you're doing is different. You represent only 2% of the planet. One great American said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dull by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will never cower before the master, nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. That's what it means to be a part of peak potentials. Your unquenching desire, an uncommon desire to manifest your greatness. Have a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing. One of the central principles of my life is that no one knows enough to be a pessimist about anything. And that each and every one of us, when we close our mind to what is possible for us or what is possible for humanity, closes off the genius that resides and lives in each and every one of us. Having an open mind doesn't necessarily mean uh, finding fault with all of the things that you've been taught by others. It means opening yourself up to the potentiality and the possibility that anything and everything is possible. So having a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing really means finding within ourselves the ability to get rid of a trait that I find so common in contemporary in the contemporary world do you know that most people that i meet spend their lives looking for occasions to be offended they actually are out there hoping that they can find some reason to be offended and there's no shortage of reasons they're out there everywhere the way this person dressed, the what the worst person said, they turn on their TV, they hear the news, they're offended by this, someone didn't, uh, someone used language that they didn't like, someone doesn't share the same customs that you, and people all day long, in fact, if you keep track tomorrow, you will find uh, probably a hundred reasons that you can go around being offended. But a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing is a mind that says, I'm never looking for anything to be offended by. 
and that whatever anybody else out there has to say, my response to that is, that's an interesting point of view. I've never considered that before. Welcome all experiences. You never know which one is going to turn everything on. Don't put up the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Take down the walls. Go for the experience. Let it teach you. You need to bet on your strengths and don't give a f about what you suck at. You're gonna, uh, way too many people in this room are gonna spend the next 30, 40 years of their lives trying to check the boxes of the things that they're not as good at and that you're gonna waste a f load of time and lose. I highly recommend auditing yourself or if you have no f***ing empathy or EQ or self-awareness, then find somebody in your family or friendship that does and let them tell you who you are. And once you believe that, either for yourself or someone else told you, go directly, all chips, all into that because that is the only possible way, in my opinion, watching from the outside, that is, let me rephrase, that is a very highly likely way of over-indexing because the truth is, if you want to be an anomaly, you've got to act like one. You know, like, and so, that's it, that's what I got. So thanks for having me. There's another kind of instinct that you need to be on the lookout for and this one is a liar. This one is a saboteur. This one is a backbiter. And like the devil himself, he's a shapeshifter. He's gonna disguise himself and make you think he's got your best interest in mind. But he doesn't. This is the instinct that says you've had enough. This is the instinct that says you've, you've, you've given it your best shot. You can, you can stand down. You can back off. You can take a knee. This is the instinct that says you can rest now. Do not listen to that instinct. Do not listen. That instinct is a liar and wants to bring you down. That's the instinct that's a, a defense mechanism. It wants to give you an out, a place to run to, a little, a little place of sympathy, an amnesty, a little place of amnesty where everything is forgiven, where all these these failures can gather together in comfort and drown their sorrows in lies and in deception. And they tell each other. And they'll tell you, you did the best you could. No, they'll say the deck, the deck, the deck was stacked against you. And they'll say it's not your fault. And they'll tell you it's okay to stop. It's okay to settle. It's okay to give up. And that is the instinct you need to fight. You need to push back to smash into the ground. Do not take the easy way out. Do not give up based on instinct. If you are forced to stand down, to retreat, so that you can rebuild and reattack, so be it. But make that decision based on logic, not on the instinct of surrender and defeat. And you need to train that instinct, your instinct. Train it to say, get up, go, fight on. And if that is what you become, if that becomes your fundamental reaction to adversity, if that becomes your gut instinct, then 
you will overcome just about anything that stands in your path.